I sent you an email earlier today. I'm hoping that you will have it. Uh, thank you, Ms. Cohen's work, sending uh, the response that you had. Appreciate that. So, what my question is today is on the agenda items 10.5 through 10.8. This is an exorbitant amount of money uh, with very little information on what the spending items will be. Uh, I've sent many emails to all of you earlier this weekend. Uh, I know it was a long weekend, but I still think they were important. And I haven't received an email or a response on my most important questions, so I will go ahead and ask that again, which is, in light of recent documents which have surfaced from the Secretary of Education, Miguel Cardona, to Governor DeSantis about the ARP slash ESSR1 and ESSER2 grants, Gear 1 or Gear 2 funds, uh, one question that needs to be answered, are you in possession of or slated to receive any state or federal funding or grants of any kind, including but not limited to the ARP ESSR gear funds and grants, FEMA, on the condition of universal masking or any current or future COVID related or similar CDC protocols of anyone, staff and or students for the entirety of the Pasco County School District? Yes or no? I was told Mr. Alfonso has a response for me, so I look forward to hearing that. Um, just questioning why you have a 40, there's, the grants are ridiculous, a $40 million grant where you have only two lines saying what's in there, there's no line breakdown. I would like to have a breakdown because a few months ago, Mr. Gadd was, was talking about the canopies and how important they were. Uh, yeah, I haven't seen a purchase order for the $18 million grant canopies, so I would, I would like to know where that was, where you find that. Also, um, when there was a grant given last year, there was a workshop for the ESSR grant but uh, for this $40 million grant, there's, there's no workshop. We don't need to know what's in there. We don't need to know why. It would be nice to understand what the information is for that. I mean, you have very nebulous things like $2.3 million for social workers. You have uh, part of the $40 million grant is Zoom software. And then you will also have a $2.3 million grant for Zoom software. How much is this Zoom software? This could be very expensive. And also telehealth. Um, in two of the grants, there's telehealth and school learning. Why is a school district using telehealth? I was unaware that you all had medical knowledge or that you were medical professionals. Shouldn't that be left to, I don't know, a doctor? If somebody has a problem with something, should they be sent to their parents so the parents can take them to their doctor? That is not school's responsibility. Also, social workers, not the school's responsibility. So I hope that you all, I have asked very detailed questions. Well, and I hope that you will respond and answer the questions accordingly. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, nice long weekend, I'm sure, by everybody. Um, I keep thinking that I'm not gonna come to these meetings anymore, that you guys are just gonna miraculously do what your people elected you consider to be the right thing. But then I see stuff like this. I know that um, we've referenced the masterminding many times um, at these meetings. I didn't know what it was, but I decided I better educate myself because it's not a lot of money in the grand scheme of things because your budget is $1.6 billion and it's only $56 million that is um, currently up for today. But I see the masterminding as nothing more than the federal government's way of masking our kids again because in that documentation, I read through it, that was really interesting by the way, um, and it says that we are going to mask our kids. Um, the letter from the Secretary of Education, it becomes clear that once we take that money, mask mandates become mandatory for our schools, um, unless I'm reading it wrong. And I, you know, I'm a public educated student. Um, our governor says that there's no mask mandates, but this letter and the documentation from the federal government says there is man mask mandates, so I'm not sure how that works. I know that a lot of the, the districts in the state are ignoring the mask mandate ban, and I would hope you aren't gonna do that. Um, I know some of you wish that Dylan had been elected and things would be quite different in our state. I would want, thank God, every day that we have Ron DeSantis as our governor. Um, yeah. 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 this meeting total, what did I say? $56.6 million. That's only 4% of our budget. Why would we allow the federal government to take money that we so graciously sent to the federal government out of our own pockets and send it back to us with all these strings attached? At some point, you have to say, no, no more. Um, I think we all do that in our personal lives. You get pushed a little bit, you get pushed a little bit more, and then at some point you say, no, stop. I'm walking away from this. And I think we're kind of at that point right now. We can't let the federal government do this. 
I mean, I know we have parents, we have teachers in our schools that are asking kids for their pronouns. I never, in my wildest dreams, ma'am, imagine that's not that's an okay. That's not an agenda. Okay, all right. So anyway, um, the rest of my thing is kind of off topic, so I won't go there. And then I just want to say one thing in closing: at no time in history have the people forcing others into compliance been the good guys. Think about that. Superintendent Browning, Attorney Alfonso, Chair Altman, Honorable School Board members and district staff, good morning. I hope you're all well. It does appear that we are in a downward trend with COVID positivity. <clears throat> Two weeks ago, Pasco was at 26%. A week ago, we were at 20%. And yesterday, it was reported that we are at 18%. While the numbers are still high, the trend is in the right direction. We all need to do what we can to be safe. Our negotiating teams continue to meet weekly in an attempt to set level of use and language regarding how to best move forward this academic year. While the situation on the surface seems troublesome, it is our goal to see that employees and students are provided the best opportunity to teach and learn in a safe and positive environment. While there are medical and political concerns that attempt to distract us, it is incumbent upon USEP and the district to stay focused on the educational protocol we have agreed upon to see to it that this year provides our students a better means to gain knowledge and to grow educationally. We continue to work with district staff towards that end. We need to be positive examples for students and parents who are struggling with an unsettling environment. We can and need to be the shining light in a politically dark environment. I hope we can continue to work together to make PASCO the best opportunity for students to expand their educational horizons and where employees strive to bring innovative experiences for their students. Thank you for what you do. Thank you, Mr. Pease. sent to me copies of emails that have been circulating regarding the ESSER and ARP funding. Um, there's, a, there's some confusion out there regarding uh, the federal funding and uh, what PASCO has done what PASCO hasn't done. Um, I uh, actually talk, spoke with the chancellor yesterday. Uh, I spoke with the chancellor Oliva again this morning uh, at the Florida Department of Education uh, regarding uh, the documents that are, that are being circulated. As I sent an email out to you last evening, uh, the letter I want to point out restates a couple of things. First, the letter that uh, Secretary Campona, uh, the United States uh, Secretary of Education sent was addressed to Governor DeSantis and to Commissioner Corcoran. It was not addressed to the local education authorities or agencies, which is us. It was addressed to uh, the two uh, as I spoke. Um, secondly, school districts, including the Pasco district, have not received any ARP money, none. Secondly, we've not received any ESSER II money, none. Um, we have, in fact, spent our ESSER I money um, and uh, if there was a mask requirement, it was because the state put that mask requirement on us and we spent the, uh, the majority of ESSER 1 during last school year when masks were required. Um, right now, we will continue following the state's protocol on masks. At the, we have submitted uh, to the Florida Department of Education uh, our budget and our plan on how we believe that our ESSER 2 money uh, funds should be spent. Uh, in Pasco. We have not been asked by the Florida Department of Education about a plan or a budget for ARP money. Uh, that is a good ways out. Um, we will continue to uh, meet the assurances uh, that uh, we're required to on every grant uh, as we get closer, but I think it's premature uh, to start talking about whether there will or won't be a mass mandate. Uh, I will assure you, uh, based on what I read and what I watch on TV, uh, there will not be a mass mandate uh, that imposes a requirement uh, for the grant. But again, if there is, then that's a fight that the state will take for the federal government, not this district. Um, so that is where we are with our ESSER and ARP money. Um, let me also point out a couple things. 
Um, there is a significant amount of federal money that has been uh, provided to states and uh, to districts, local districts, via the State Departments of Education. That money is primarily and purposely used to remediate kids. Um, uh, we, I think it's evident in our test scores, although when you saw a 4% or a four point drop in our third grade ELA scores uh, this year, um, I continue to be grateful that it was only 4% when I had uh, counties throughout our districts throughout the state that were dropping double digits. I will tell you, our staff, uh, including our principals, our teachers, our district staff that supports classrooms, worked their tails off trying to ensure that, that students were being supported uh, during this tough time, uh, whether last year they were in the classroom or learning virtually. Uh, they continue to work hard uh, to ensure that those kids, all kids, are receiving the supports that they need in order to be academically successful. Um, we have, uh, as pointed out by one of our speakers this morning, there are grants, uh, plans for ESSER 2 that we are bringing to the board today. Um, we have to put these in place so that we can start moving in the direction of providing academic tutors in K-5, uh, IAs in all of our kindergarten classrooms, because that in fact supports remediation and helping our kids get caught up because of the learning loss due to where we found ourselves with COVID. Um, it may be a noble effort to say enough is enough and we don't want any more federal money. But I will tell you, uh, we would be shooting ourselves in the foot if we did not have those funds in order to help support those students and catch them up where they need to be uh, this academic year. Uh, we continue to monitor the progress of our students. We provide uh, providing uh, targeted supports for these students. Um, social workers are vital. Uh, they are absolutely vital. Uh, and in one of the grants we are hiring through state dollars um, uh, through the state budget, uh, there was a, a part of the appropriation for missing students. And that's where we developed the social services coordinators, for lack of a better term, uh, because those are the ones that are out there working hard to try to find the students that are, that are missing, uh, that are having attendance issues in our schools, uh, because kids cannot learn if kids are not in school. Um, I will tell you well, 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 over the majority of those federal ESSER dollars are being used and are directed to schools and students in order to, to get to where they need to be academically. So to recap, uh, we're not even talking ARC right now. Um, we, we are, we're just in the early processes of the ESSER II grant. And uh, we're waiting for some uh, determination from FDOE as to whether or not our budget and our plan uh, meets the assurances uh, they've set out. And then uh, at the appropriate time, our Department of Education will then say, let's start talking about ARC. Um, and my understanding is that the state has not even applied uh, for any of the ARC money yet uh, that will be coming to, uh, to the district. So I just wanted to clarify a couple points. Uh, everything, everything, and I want board members and our public to understand this, everything that we're doing um, with ESSER 1, ESSER 2, and ARC is primarily focused on our kids, our students, uh, and making sure that we can get them where they need to be and get caught up. So when we finally do get out of COVID, maybe if we ever get out of COVID, uh, that they are academically positioned uh, to be successful. That's uh, that's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Mr. Gann. Um, I also want to add um, to what the superintendent said about grants and it was alluded to earlier. Um, the health department grant that we brought before the board a long time ago um, that dated back to April, uh, we have not seen a penny of that funding as of yet. Um, that is a health department grant, not a school district grant. We are dependent on the health department to manage and work with us on that grant. We have not seen a penny of funding from that grant. It's frustrating for the people that work uh, for the Pasco County School System because they put plans in place trying to help children, help teachers, help employees. And those plans are in place for months and uh, we don't see the money. We don't understand the log jam and what's going on related to the log jam. In reference to ARC, which a, a superintendent talked about, I spoke to the senior chancellor, uh, Eric Hall, last week. 
and um, they had uh, had some discussions about ARP, but he didn't know when there would be any information coming down to the school districts. So it's not due to lack of effort on the part of the people that you often see in this room and that you reflect with and work with. Um, uh, we have a lot of good things that we could be accomplished with that funding. In particular, the thing that's most important to me, which is um, all the tutoring and resources we need for kids to make up for some of the things that happened last year. And we just haven't seen the funding to make all of those things happen yet. But we continue to have faith that eventually some of that funding will come through and we can accomplish some of the things we want to do um, for children. Um, so, but just to summarize, I want to make it clear to everyone that that health department grant does not sit with us. It sits with the health department. It is their grant. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Penn. The point of this really is to try and summarize where we are right now with this um, litigation and the mask mandate concern. I know it's been the topic for much discussion. In fact, there's probably got 20 cards that have been submitted today for public comment after this is over with. So all of this uh, is really just to give a kind of a high level uh, topical visual overview of what the story is right now legally on the uh, the mask issue, uh, face covering issue. So I, I don't know what y'all can see. I'm looking at the uh, what I think is the monitor of this. That's the introductory slide. I'm trying to get through pretty quickly. The main point, um, there are several pieces of what's going on that is currently in the landscape of the, uh, the face covering issue. The first one is uh, Governor DeSantis' executive order, number 21175. And, and despite what everybody says about things, the executive order is pretty simple, actually. It's pretty straightforward. It just kind of says that, you know, it's directing other state agencies to do things. Uh, specifically, it directs the health department to develop a rule as does uh, it, as it does the Florida Department of Education to direct rulemaking exercises to make sure that as a result of any safety protocols that are implemented, no one violates Flir Floridians' constitutional freedoms, and secondly, that no one violates the recently implemented uh, Parents' Bill of Rights. Those are the two pieces that are most significantly cited in the governor's executive order. If you flip to the next slide. The part that makes it a little bit more controversial is section three. It talks about uh, the Florida Commissioner of Education shall pursue all legal means available to ensure that school districts adhere to Florida law, including but not limited to withholding state funds. So that statement certainly did create quite a buzz. Shortly after it was made, I believe the executive uh, office for the governor uh, at least indicated a clarification on that to say that they were only referring to salaries for school board members and superintendents. So that has been at least trimmed down a little bit. That's what's going on with the executive order. If you feel one, Mr. Kappel. So referenced in there is the health department. Um, and shortly after that emergency order, the health department did a notice of emergency rule, the number of which is indicated. In the big scheme of this discussion, this is probably the single most important thing that's at play in a lot of the discussion about masks. It, it simply is the health department rolling out protocols for appropriate uh, COVID protocols and included with them are, you know, the directions that schools should encourage routine cleaning, hand washing, and then they say most importantly students may wear masks or facial covering uh, as a mitigation measure. However, the school must allow for a parent or legal guardian to opt out. And then, of course, there's another piece of language which is highlighted, but it's really not as big. I mean, the point is, for those districts that do have an opt-out, and that's at play, then there is a provision that talks about um, prohibiting any harassment or discriminatory treatment for students who opt-out. Before we move on, that's okay, you can leave it there, Mr. Dunn, that's fine. Uh, this slide's in here to tell you all what the story is, but it just doesn't apply, because, you know, it, this isn't, Pasco County has not adopted a mandate. So it doesn't really apply to Pasco at all at this point in time. It's just much of the discussion throughout the state, which we'll talk about in a few later slides, is the some of the districts that have in fact uh, done a, a mask mandate. And they talk about the different opt-outs and whether they violate the, the executive order. So next slide, please. Thank you. 
Meanwhile, the State Board of Education has adopted a few emergency rules, and I don't want to spend a lot of time in these other than to say, you know, one was related just to the issue of how uh, to count attendance in this COVID era, and the second one was really just talking about the HOPE scholarships. So it's kind of a, just saying that's an option that's available for those people who want to leave the uh, conventional system, uh, whatever school they're in, if they've been subject to harassment. Next slide, please. All right, so then there's the uh, uh, Parents' Bill of Rights, which really was adopted by the legislature, signed into law July, effective July 1st. And this is really, uh, it's got a lot more to it, so I, I'm not trying to get a big presentation into the whole you know, sub and substance of it. It has a lot of implications, the chapter. But as it relates to the face covering issue, there's really this issue that I've quoted there that just talks about, you know, parents certainly have and should continue to have this principal right of making decisions concerning their children. Uh, candidly, I practice family law for about 30 years now, and I, I think that's the law, and it, it has been the law for a long time, that this Bill of Rights actually reduces it to writing and puts it by the education uh, chapters. And it talks about if and to the extent something's going to happen where a school district is going to do something, and they're going to intervene on a health or uh, an educational issue, whatever law has to be demonstrated to be reasonable and necessary to achieve a compelling state interest and it has to be narrowly tailored so uh, and, and not otherwise served by the least restrictive means. So those just give parameters to say school districts, in my humble opinion, you haven't lost your right or your obligation to make rules and regulate the school system in, in Pasco County or whatever district you're in but you have to make certain that if and to the extent you're going to pass a rule that bumps into a compelling uh, uh, one of these parent bill of rights issues, you have to have a really good reason, and you have to do it in the, the light, with the lightest touch possible. This is just more of the same slide. Again, there's a lot of rights that are identified there. Next slide, please. So pending uh, action in court, I, I you know, uh, this past week was probably a lot like uh, those other big days where a whole bunch of people who don't generally care about the news were all glued to the TVs and radios to listen to their YouTube to watch uh, what was going on with the Leon County case. Um, I'm sorry, that was a week ago. The court announced its ruling a few weeks ago. There's this case in Leon County, the gist of which is um, it's filed against the governor, the Department of uh, Education, and it's a six or seven count complaint that alleges a lot of different constitutional infringements that were engaged in by the governor. The order was announced a week back. It was reduced to writing last week, signed by the judge, and effectively the judge's order as signed, which is the only thing I can ever think about, because nothing happens when a judge announces an order. It's when it's signed that it matters because we know what it says. The order uh, effectively doesn't do anything for a couple of the reasons they asked, found some unconstitutional provisions based upon the governor's executive order saying, I mean, this is a very shallow summary, but saying, well, there was no state of emergency that you declared, so there is no emergency. So you couldn't do the executive order as an emergency, and it's outside of your scope of authority. That's the gist of it. That lawsuit, uh, well, so to finish that point, the, the order was signed, found the governor's action unconstitutional in a very narrow sense, and the Department of Education's uh, conduct as well to enforce that order. The order was appealed immediately by the governor. And there's a whole bunch of laws that talk about when a governmental entity is involved in litigation, and there's an order that's entered adverse to that entity, and that entity then appeals that decision. They're entitled by law to a stay pending appellate review of that action. So the order says what it says, but it's really not effective to do anything until the entire process of appellate action goes through. So, for those people who thought, some, you know, some were, hey, this is terrible, the governor's order has been overturned, well, that, nothing's happened yet. For those people who are happy, oh yeah, they overturned the governor, well, nothing's happened yet. So nothing has happened with regard to the constitutionality of the governor's order. It stayed pending review, and that review may take who knows how long. Shortly after that opinion, the appeal was filed, the plaintiffs filed a request to set aside the stay, and they asked that of the trial judge. And that is set for hearing. I haven't seen the actual notice, but I think it's set for hearing this week, maybe tomorrow. 
but whoever is watching, it's really not that big a deal because the way the law works on that issue is if the trial judge says, okay, yeah, you don't get the appeal, I would not stay pending appeal, that decision is subject to appeal and the law supports very much granting government the appeal. I'm not trying to put odds on it, but I'm just saying that it's not even enough to say that that's over. It's just going to be another flurry of news um, until we find out what's going to happen with the order in the state. Spend a lot of time on that slide. Please keep going. This is what I already said about the summary of all the pieces, and there are a lot of pieces to it. You can go on the next slide, please. Then there's the federal claim, at least one case, and I, I should say there's probably a bunch more cases, but these are the two that are principally the ones that are being uh, really focused on by all, they're the, the highest profile cases. The federal claim case is pending in the Southern District of, uh, of Florida in federal courts. Uh, Pasco is named among the defendants in there, and we have a hearing on that tomorrow. But principally that hearing is about the governor, uh, that's gonna be where most of the discussion will be about the constitutionality in federal court of the mask mandate. I, I set for tomorrow at one o'clock, so you'll see there'll be another news cycle about what happened with that order. There are different rules about appeals in those cases, so I, I don't even wanna go into that. Let's just see how the court rules tomorrow because that's really what it's gonna be about. The same general rules apply that whatever the ruling, it might be subject to an immediate stay while they pursue constitutional review. Next slide, please. So, um, again, not a huge thing. You guys probably already know this slide uh, was to identify at least some of the surrounding counties as to what's going on about mask mandates versus not mask mandates. Um, uh, the detail on this is less important about the mandate or not mandate. The more important part is the opt-outs. A lot of districts have imposed mandates Fernando just recently did it by an emergency at the meeting, um, but the mandate was to comply with the governor's order, which was to give, or the, at least the health department's order, to give a parental opt-out. So it's mandated unless you have the parental opt-out. Hillsborough has a mandate with a medical-only opt-out, and that's one of the reasons that they're having problems with the state. The rest of the list just goes through that, but the gist of it all is that Lake County's recommended, Levy recommended, Marion mandated with a parental opt-out, Pinellas is recommended, much like we are, but not required, as is Polk and Sumner. Thank you. Next slide. That's a restatement of the same thing. Um, I will say that, that um, most of those districts that have the mandates for only the medical opt-out, most of them are in fact tied to a fairly short window of time to just say, well, it's gonna be reviewed in 30 days or so. Because I think everybody, those districts that are doing it are trying to minimize their, their incompatibility with the, the rule, try to say we're gonna review them quickly so that they can roll out of the bad graces that are otherwise created by not complying with the uh, executive order from the governor. Next slide, please. So, uh, you already know, uh, yeah, the only thing about the slide that's important is those districts that don't have a uh, parent opt-out, there are now a total of 13. All of them are currently, even with notwithstanding the uh, the Ladinian County case, all of them are still being hailed to the Department of Education to talk about how, what are the consequences of not complying with the executive order in the Department of Health. Next slide. So as I already said, Pasco's current situation is that uh, we have the recommended but not um, required. So that tells you what you already know. Next slide, please. Um, and questions, which I think you'll already probably ask me about, but if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to address them. The first one is Sylvania Holiday and then to be followed by Rebecca Yingling. Good morning, thank you. My name is Ivana Molivec. I have three kids, 15, seven year old, and four year old. I'm talking here as a parent, I'm concerned with the COVID is no a secret. The thing that you see on the news, I get tired last month of what I'm on, June, was in the news because they are scary, they get you frustrated. Things that were getting better, I went to the supermarket without masks, we were happy, went back. Then two, three weeks before going back to school, I go to my doctor, my doctor said cases are high at the hospital. I'm not watching the news. I start listening to people that I trust with my health, my neighbors too, that I have two neighbors that are nurses. And my kids, uh, pediatrician, say, yep, cases are high. Highly recommend the kids to wear masks. It's important they go back to school. My seven-year-old has allergies. And um, allergies cause him to get asthma attacks. I have seen my kid suffer 
At 4 o'clock in the morning, having a hard time trying to breathe, and that is a scary. That's why I'm so concerned about this COVID, because COVID is like, oh, when you have a, a, a asthma and grass or pollen that is so high, that causes people to get asthma attacks. Asthma attacks de deprive of breathing. And see a kid, a seven year old kid, wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning crying and scared because he cannot breathe. Breathe is the worst thing that I ever live in my life. And we have flu, and we have spectro, and we have all kinds of, you know, with three kids. <laughs> I'm not a doctor, but I mind you go through all this thing with your kids. It's a scary. I had this, I had a four year old three years ago. She has a virus, like a different one because the, the other virus has here around. And her virus gave her um, wheezing. And wheezing, I mean that your kid cannot talk and her belly go up and down and her throat too because they cannot breathe. That's a scary. And here as a bite, Sharing my experience, what I think is important to consider the mass at the school. I, I just don't care about my kids. I have that experience, but I, get, I care about my community. I care about has family that are nurses. They told me how it is at the hospital. I have a family member that is a veteran, has been serving, and then he's a physician, and he has been on the COVID front for the last, week when all this started. Three weeks ago, he told me, you know what? I'm not the COVID unit anymore because I joined this career to help people and I'm not helping people at the hospital and the COVID unit because they're not getting vaccinated and the unvaccinated are dying. It's still in the emergency room, but it's not the COVID unit anymore. That scares me because my eight year old doesn't, and my four year old doesn't have that option yet to be vaccinated or have the treatment. That's <laughs> I'm still going to stay on uh, pronouns and enticing our kids with teachers. So I've been doing some research of what you guys should have been doing, what you guys are hired to do. Um, I sent an email out last week um, addressing the principal at my daughter's high school and yourself, everybody up there, except for, I believe, you, Mr. Alfonso. I do appreciate that we are respecting the law of the masks, by the way. It is the law. Um, my daughter was asked to reaffirm herself as a female. My daughter was asked by a teacher to, if she wanted to be a boy or have multiple different personalities, she could do that alone with a teacher in secret, away from my knowledge, away from other students' knowledge, away from other teachers' knowledge. I sent to the school in writing my daughter's not to fill out these forms. She's filled out two. In response, my daughter is now given a graded test by a third teacher at this school, graded, to answer these questions and to keep it secret. And is there anything else I should know with a smiley face? My daughter should not have to reaffirm if she's a boy or a girl. My daughter shouldn't be questioned to ask if she wants to be a boy or a girl. I have raised these questions to the district. I've raised them to the administration at the school. However, nothing's been done. Nothing, nothing. Okay, I'm pissed. I go through, my daughter and other students are telling me, there's stickers all over the schools on the teacher's doors. G-L-S-E-N organization.org. I sent you all an email on it last week. This organization believes that Students should be surveyed in school regarding pronouns and LGBT communities. They encourage teachers to collect da data. They pay people of the ages of 18 to 25 to work 12 to 25 hours or 12 to 20 hours per month and pay them $20,000 a year to gain this information. This is a 501C corporation. Um, they went from 6 million to 12 million. The executive director of Gislein says, police do not belong in schools. Only the removal of police SROs can end violence. This is this, I was, I sent, directed for an answer and I got a response from Matt Wicks, who is the athletic supervisor, telling me it's a safe space for all kids. Really? Um, my family, my husband's law enforcement officer, so explain to me how it's a safe space. 
for Christians, conservatives, law enforcement to go to if there's a problem. It's 1,000% discrimination. It needs to be dealt with now. I want these people to remove. If you can't remove them, I'm going to remove you. issue. Uh, Dr. Isle has met with Ms. Yingling, her husband, her daughter, together. Uh, they have met with the administration. Uh, this was an issue that occurred at the start of the school year, uh, and we have dealt with it. We have told Ms. Yingling that it was investigated and it was dealt with. I will also tell you that we are not collecting any data from GLSEN uh, about whether or not kids are going to identify as a male or female. We don't do that. We dealt with the pronoun issue, uh, but yet she continues to raise this issue over and over and over again to the point where she's filed complaints with the Florida Department of Education. They have since said, we're not dealing with this. It will go back down to the local school board. And as far as I'm concerned, the matter is closed. We have dealt with, with Ms. Yangling. We have dealt with this issue at Cypress Creek High School. Why are there stickers all over the doors? Why are there stickers all over the doors? No, she raised a good point, Mr. Chairman, and let me just address the stickers. We have no relationship with GLSEN, but I will tell you that, that whether we like it or not, there are kids throughout our system, throughout our system, that cannot, maybe not, unlike your daughter, Ms. Yingling, that has a parent that they can talk to openly about things that are impacting their lives. We have data in this district knowing the, the suicide rates of kids please. And, and, and I said from the very beginning, since I've sat in this seat, I don't care if you're red, pink, purple, blue, or green with horns on your head. If you are a student in this system, you will have a safe, safe learning environment. I don't care if you're gay, straight, I don't care if you're white, black, Latino, I don't care, I don't care because I am charged of managing the system and providing a world-class education to every student that we have in our care. And that is what I will continue to do as long as I'm superintendent. Now, I will tell you, this is what sidetracks us from doing the work of this district, and that is educating our kids. The amount of time that we spend continuing to deal with issues like this is, is just abhorrent to me. The, the fact is well, we ought to be spending our time on trying to figure out how we can deal with kids and meet kids where they are. So, so, all I'm saying is this issue over pronouns, matter of fact, I sent an email out district-wide to district staff. I said I won't. I, I told them what I want on signature lines. As This is absurd for a superintendent to have to sp send an email out to district staff retooling what I believe ought to be in signature lines. I believe you ought to have your name, your title, your department, and your contact information, period. That means no pronouns, no scripture verses, which I read scripture every day, by the way. There's no coaches of baseball, no, none of that. That is what I want to see. So the, the whole pronoun issue, when we find this out, we deal with that. But we're, we're not going to continue to, to, to keep beating this dead horse over and over again. If we have a new situation where there is a teacher out there or a principal or some school administrator that is, uh, or personnel that's, that's talking pronouns, I'll deal with it. But we don't need to be doing it the same situation over and over and over again. We've got it under control. No, it was, it was, it should not have been done in the very beginning, but, but we addressed it. We addressed it very quickly. I worked with our assistant superintendents on addressing that issue. And I, I make no apologies for being a little agitated this morning because it distracts me. It distracts this district. And we have a great amount of pressure on us to ensure that all of our kids are getting the education that they need. That's what, that's what the burden is on me. That's what the burden is on these folks that are sitting around this table today and our yeah, teachers yeah. in our classrooms. Can I get the stickers off the window? Just to add to the, the 
those stickers, um, I totally agree that nobody should bully any child regardless. But I am here to tell you that there are a lot of children who pull up that site and see that they're not included in there. So it's not an inclusive group, just to clarify. There are children who are very frustrated over those stickers because they're not included. So just keep that in mind. I want to talk about the grants. So clearly, uh, what Mr. Browning said, the state is not the one who's going to tell the districts what to do um, because we see districts that are violating that right now from what the attorney shared. And I do appreciate you speaking up today. That, that's very important that we hear from you. Um, but to put any conditions against the right of a parental choice by law, it's not okay. Um, and what concerns me the most in, in your statement that you made to the board is that you did not say no. You did not say you would not consider that condition. Um, and I just wanted to read from the letter uh, that we have from the um, Secretary of Education. Activities that are necessary to maintain the operation and continuity of services in local educational agencies and continuing to employ existing staff in the local educational agency. This includes paying the full salaries of educators, including superintendents and school board members, so what he's saying, uh, Mr. Cohen is saying, is he will let them be paid money to violate state laws with our tax dollars. I have a huge issue with that. Um, in addition, in that letter, uh, it says the department will continue to work directly with the school districts and educators that serve Florida students. So that statement is concerning to me as well. That's not telling me that the governor or the Department of Education, it's saying that they, Cardona's, group will continue to work directly with the school districts and educators that serve for students. So he also speaks about the CDC in there. So here's CDC. Um, wear a mask. Don't wear a mask. Wear two masks. Three feet, six feet, ten feet, fourteen feet. Airborne virus. Transmissible, not transmissible. Vaccine will protect you. It won't protect you. Don't even get me started on their website and their data because it's not up to date. It's not current. It's not factual at any given time. And they're they send retractions or they'll speak out information or provide new data um, to back up the, the mistakes or the errors they have made. Um, it doesn't make any sense. I was very glad to hear you talk about suicide awareness because that is definitely a concern that we have. So I'm glad to hear that. I would love to see some of this money spent um, to look into that and to really help those children because we've lost more kids in suicide than COVID.
those at Baxter Elementary School where I do volunteer do not have the option to be vaccinated as the vaccines are not approved for those under the age of 12 by the FDA. This means that anyone under the age of 12 must rely on masks to protect themselves from COVID-19. Without any mask mandate, they are being put at unnecessary risk of exposure to COVID-19 in school. I also understand, as Mr. Alfonso referenced in his slide, show that there is hesitation regarding this decision due to Governor DeSantis' threat to pull funding from schools. But as Post and Forbes Magazine and many other reputable media sources on August 13, 2021, the Biden administration has stated that federal funds can be used to cover Florida school board salaries if Governor DeSantis defunds them over mask mandates. There is a plan in place if DeSantis' plan is enacted. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Uh, some people said some comments that they really were not to be true. Uh, if you go to the store, you buy several masks. Uh, I've seen millions of them in the store. This one says not intended for medical or health care use, not FDA approved. I see kids stepping on their mask. I see people that take their mask off, open the door, touch everything, put their mask back on, and at a restaurant they put it down like that. You know, every, we all touch the same avocado in Walmart. Um, I just want to say that in March of 2020, uh, the CDC said masks are usually not recommended in non-healthcare settings. The World Health Organization that same month recommended that people not wear face masks unless they are sick with COVID-19 or caring for someone who is sick. There's no specific evidence to suggest that wearing a mask by the mass, mass population has any benefit, potential benefit. In fact, there's some evidence to suggest the opposite is uh, in the misuse of wearing a mask properly or fitting properly, said Dr. Mike Ryan, executive director of the World Health Organization. A study earlier this year by the University of Louisville found that state mask mandates did not help slow the spread of COVID-19. They found that prolonged mask use more than four hours a day promotes facial alkalinization and it inadvertently encourages dehydration, which in turn can enhance barrier breakdown bacterial infection risk. British clinicians have reported masks to increase headaches, sweating, and decrease cognitive pre precision. By obscure, and also by obscuring nonverbal communication, masks interfere with social learning in children. Uh, the first large randomized controlled study of its kind shows no statistic, statistically significant difference in COVID-19 <laughs> cases between people who wore masks and those who did not. A study by the Centers for Disease Control in October indicated that Americans were adhering to mask mandates, but the requirements didn't appear to have slowed or stopped the spread of coronavirus, and further found mask wearing has negative effects. I have um, some information here that really talks about some of the negative effects of uh, wearing masks. We're seeing more increased uh, anxiety, mental illness, like you had alluded to as far as uh, suicide rates. A lot of that is maybe from COVID, but also our way in, in which we have dealt with COVID. Uh, like I said, uh, you know, some of the information you're hearing isn't accurate. And I think there's been a lot of suppression of uh, information that perhaps you're not getting. We're seeing censoring of YouTube. There's a YouTube of Governor DeSantis talking to Harvard professors, and it was censored. So, you know, there's uh, lots of information that people aren't getting. I think a lot of people in the room say, if you want to get vaccinated, get vaccinated. If you want to wear a mask, wear a mask. But if you think vaccinations work and mask works, then Thank you me. should feel protected from me because I've decided not to wear a mask. Awesome. In national testing, 22 ahead. out of the whole country. It's not acceptable. Uh, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Um, John Paul, um, I want to uh, reiterate, if I could, make some comments by um, Superintendent Brown from, from last month's uh, uh, board meeting well, on the 17th, where he states that. Um, COVID has caused $12 million in claims for the county, and that the county at that time was $4 million in deficit. Um, at that time, there were 1,261 cases, and only 300 some had been contact traced, so there was a, a shortage of somewhere around 800 or so from being contact traced just because there's so many cases. Um, my daughter, 
has three friends who were quarantined. Um, two of those were tested positive. My daughter herself, just to this past Wednesday, was quarantined with symptoms. Luckily, we just got the results yesterday that she was COVID negative. Um, I worked for 25 years in the healthcare industry. We wore masks when there was a health hazard. We are living in a global pandemic. Masks have been proven to be effective. I've heard reports that they're 99% effective in stopping the transmission of the virus. I'm, I'm a little disappointed to hear that you're not considering, um, at this time at least, moving forward with a mask mandate. But it's so confusing that last year, the governor mandated masks. This year, he's banned the mandating of masks. So which way are we going here? The CDC has suggested that the guidelines are to wear masks for the safety of our students. You all are, are charged with the safety of our students. I appreciate that nearly everyone here is wearing a mask. That shows that you're concerned about this pandemic and we want to stop the spread of it. If we want to stop the spread of this pandemic and get back to normal, the best thing to do is to stop the transmission. And uh, the mere wearing a mask will get the job done. My name is Kimberly and I'm a I have a child in attendance at Pasco High School, um, Pasco County High School. Unlike half of the, the anti-maskers here, I actually have a student here. It's astonishing to me that the same people that call themselves <laughs> If you would address your comments, you would address your comments to the board, please. All I'm saying is that half of these people call themselves pro-life, but they won't save my child's life. I would do, can you please ask them to be quiet? Literally. Thank you. So it's astonishing to me that somebody that says that they're on the party of family values is willing to let my child die. But I guess since he's already born, that doesn't count, right? So we as parents are left with no choice but to send the school, our children to the schools. All we're asking is for you to put a cover over their mouth. It's not that difficult. It really isn't. But because they won't, their children could give my child this illness. Then that, my child can come home and give it to my son who is, has asthma. Or my parents who live in my home that are elderly and cannot get the shots. How, how fair is that? You're not just putting my child at risk, you're putting my family at risk. You're putting our neighbors at risk. You're putting yourselves at risk. You're giving accolades to teachers on one, on one hand and mourning their death on the other. How is that possible? It's not astonishing in one way because I know that you, Kurt Browning, and this entire school board has given information to the sheriff's office for the pre-crime policing so you're not protecting our children there. I mean, so why would I expect if you're not going to protect our children by, you know, from the police to school, from the school to prison pipeline, why would I expect you to protect our children from this mask, from this disease? We don't need you to parent our children. I understand that. But you're the Board of Education. Use some common sense and understand that you already have a cesspool of bacteria and viruses in a school anyway. Now you have one that's literally killing children and people. We have 800 members of our community here in Pasco. Over 800 people have lost their lives to this. Isn't that enough? Don't you care about those children? Don't you care about their parents, their grandparents, their brothers, their sisters? I care enough about your children to do anything for them. I'm literally asking you to put a mask on your face and have the teachers and the students and the bus drivers and all of the staff put a mask on theirs. Woo! You must have some terrorists like this woman in here, so, you know. Terrorists. Oh, domestic terrorists right here. So let me, let me just warn you. There's gonna be zero tolerance, zero tolerance. And the officer will remove you. Everybody understand? Okay. We'll, we'll proceed. Yep. Hi, my name is Christine Hillen, and um, I'm here to just speak my thoughts 
So uh, good morning to you all, and I realize you all are in a very difficult situation, and we are all called to love each other and be kind to each other. Although we are intense times, and our passion and our emotions run very deeply, and we're only human, and sometimes they do get the best of us, and that's including me. I don't think that's that we don't care for each other. I think we just need to get better at dealing with our emotions. Roger, for a moment, please. She just needs to watch you all I want her out. She hit me on the way back and the way up. I'm not sure. Folks, we will clear. All right. We're going to stop public This is going to be the last. This is going to be the last. Everybody understand? We will clear the room. Excuse me. I'm you're not a border, sir. Not a border, no. a border no. sir. So you're you're condoning people walking past hitting people. I, you were condoning. I did not. I did not condoning. see it. This man was right here. He watched her walk into me and shove me over. And then when she walks <laughs> back, she goes like that and hits me with her knee. No, you're going to condone that. Now, if I had it done, right. that, he would be dragging my ass out in handcuffs. Bullshit. This was over here saying, oh, I protect black women. She tells me to fuck you when she walks past. No, absolutely not. I'm not the one being disruptive. They had no reason to get up. They had no reason to get up. We are one at a time. All right. This is going to be the last. This is going to be the last warning. We will clear the room. And bring the speakers that have cards one at a time. Y'all put the phones up and listen to the speakers and let's move ahead, okay? This is ludicrous. People came, took the time, they got three minutes. An hour of public comment. And we're, we're about, we're running out of public comment time. And when we're done, we're done. Okay? All right, ma'am, go ahead. Okay, so as I was saying, we really all need to love each other. That's what we're called to do. I know it's hard because emotions run deep, right? So um, I believe God has given us everything we need, and we should be listening to, if you're not already, other sources of information that are not on the news 24-7, okay? There are other doctors, scientists, and other people in the medical industry that are putting their livelihoods on the line to share the truth and the facts with everybody. Uh, Dr. Judy Mikovich, Dr. Simone Gold, she's with American Frontline Doctors. I suggest if you wanna to listen to other people in the medical industry with their expertise, uh, frankspeech.com is one. And um, I, I think we should, you know, People want the masks, people don't want the masks. I believe it's a parent's choice. It's up to us as parents to raise and protect our children. We need to teach them individual responsibility. We need to teach them other things they can do for their health. We have amazing bodies created by God, okay? If we are taking the right vitamins, supplements, and minerals, our bodies will do amazing things and protect us from amazing things. So I think we all need to do that. I think you all probably have checked out different sources of information, and I hope you do, because you deserve uh, to do that for your role as where you sit in our community to serve the people. And uh, I just really think that, you know, are there things being done in the schools to educate the students on what they can do to better protect their bodies? You know, again, vitamin C, D, and all that stuff. Or is it just listen to us, this is what you need to do, don't ask questions, you know, show the science, show the education, show the facts and the truth to everybody. Thank you. Today, there, there are two sides that are obviously very passionate. 
But what I haven't heard is the 4,200 cases of COVID that are reported as of Friday. I'm alarmed. I am totally alarmed. That is a fact. That is on the school website. Every day I watch the numbers grow between 200 to 300 a day are being reported as positive, representing students, teachers, and staff that are missing school and are being affected by this pandemic within our schools. I implore you to do something. I appreciate the lawyer's uh, presentation. We can learn a lot from that, but there are still, within Florida, there are 13 other districts that have had the guts to stand up and do what's right. When you have alarming numbers at 4,000, at 4, I am absolutely bewildered as to why you're not doing something about this. It's not even reported and discussed today. At the last board meeting, which I had to watch the, the recording and I saw Superintendent Brown in your, your reports on this, it was just over 1,000, I mean 1,200, three weeks ago. And here we are today with this alarming rise that nothing has been done. In our high schools, my daughters tell me, and we heard it from Helen, the other very eloquent student, who I don't even know, but I was proud of her. They are not wearing masks. It's not enough to recommend via video the way you did, and I thank you for that, Superintendent Brown, but it is not enough. Change the communication. Require masks with an opt-out for those, and I, I respect that there are some people who don't who can't wear it for various medical or psychological reasons. Create a way to let them opt out, but do something before it's too late. Our kids are gonna be hospitalized potentially and maybe something even more tragic. And then I guess we'll get some movement at that time when we're in the news with something perhaps. Don't take the risk, make it short term. I believe there are ways you can get around, especially if there is a stay on Wednesday perhaps there are things you can do. 13 other school districts in Florida have done the right thing. Why not PASCO? I implore you to do it today. Um, so I'm also fighting for them too. 
Uh, we need to continue to allow people to choose what is best for them and their family. I'm Alexandra Khalil. My, I am happy to write down my address. I am, uh, do you have a concern? I got it. From my address. All right, and then you'll be followed by May 18th. I'm sorry, go ahead. Thank you. Thank Hi, you. everyone. How are you? My name is Alexandra Khalil. I am the president of the Progressive Caucus of Tampa Bay. We focus on electing local leaders and candidates. I'm a member of the Casco Coalition that has 100 members and a petition of 50,000 uh, signatures on the color of change petition to end the data sharing program. I'm a proud member of the Equity Advisory Board, board here in Pasco Schools, where I get to learn and share with the lovely members of my community. Some of you are here now, and it's a great to always see you in person. I want to thank everyone for your service and your continued dedication to our students. Um, I would like to ask a few questions about the statistics. Do we have any data from our neighboring counties on the effects of when the mask was mandated? and when the mask was not mandated, particularly Hillsboro. So I'm just going to help you. Uh, let's make a rhetorical question sure. so you can fire them all off. because I'm, I'm happy to take those um, if you have those statistics later. Um, I do have some statements on how to make these meetings a little bit more equitable. This is not at the advisory of the equity board. This is just my statements personally. Um, I wish that our meetings were a little bit later. 9.30 is the exact time that I drop my students off. Our counties are gigantic, and there are no major highways that go through them. So if our meeting started at 10.30 or 11, we can have more parents uh, come. And for the equity for our teachers, I think that we should allow our teachers to be able to submit videos or anonymous comments so that their words can be heard on the record in public comments as well, since they are, in fact, teaching us our kids right now. My next statement is, uh, since our counties are so large, I wish that there were town hall meetings or more town hall meetings with our district so that we can have these discussions. We don't have to take time off work, uh, time off school, and our evenings are long already. My next statement is, I don't think that we should have to uh, submit our address. Um, as you saw today, there's always already a little bit of violence in this room. And I think that writing down our address, typing it in, or another way would be the best way to give you that information without someone who's able to record this and share our Facebook Live without any limitations. My next statement is, I don't think this room is wheelchair accessible. Um, I was watching if the young woman happened to nudge that man back there. There's no space. I don't think it's 20 inches. We are very crammed in here. Um, so I hope that we can take a look at that and figure something out. Um, I do have a few more statements. If we do have, um, I wish that you would take a vote on masks. I expect you to take a vote on masks. I expect you to do a parent survey in our counties. In any way you want, emails in our parent portal, it doesn't matter. Please vote on masks. Thank you, Hello, I'm also, I'm giving my address publicly. I have been followed home and harassed by some of the folks probably in this room today. Um, my name is Maya King, and um, I just, I have, I also had a nice speech trip today, but honestly, after sitting in the room and hearing and seeing some, some of you guys seem like you just really don't care, um, I don't really want to waste my time in doing that. But all I do want to say is that I have a child that was born one pound five ounces, okay? Mm -hmm. He's now 12 years old. He fought for his life for the first two years on oxygen. I have no choice but to go to work in support of my family, okay? He has no choice but to go to school and get an education. We have had choices in the past of doing an online school. We did that for a year and a half. I was a teacher as well as a working mother of four children, okay? So I just want you guys to understand that whenever you're sitting here and you're in your phone most of the time, or you're sitting here feeling emails or doing whatever it is that you're doing and you have parents who are scared their children are going to die, it's disrespectful. And I really expect more from you guys, honestly. Like, it's sad me that we have such a high rate of deaths and we have hospitalizations of children rocketing and you guys are sitting here acting like you don't have any difficult choices to make. I don't envy your position. I thank you all for showing up here today because this is unacceptable. Yes, sir. Okay. Troy Peterson. Your card, I'm sorry. Your yes. You know, it's it's been a while since I've been here, and uh, I come as a concerned citizen, as a a pastor, a leader, 
on county boards of directors and all that. And when I was praying this morning, um, what would the Lord have me speak on? And I was reminded, being here about a year and a half ago, and I held this very bottle up, and I asked you, Mr. Browning, if you believe this to be true. And you said yes. You said yes. And I want to I want to thank each and every one of you for what you do. First and foremost, because you have a very tough job, a very tough job. And so when I was praying on the way here, actually it didn't happen until I got in the room here. I believe the Lord had given me a scripture, and it is in uh, John ten ten, the thief, and we know who he is. He's the devil. He comes to lie, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I, that being Jesus Christ, have come that you might have life and that they may have life more abundantly. What I see with this whole mass thing and everything that's going on is a distraction to deter us from what's really going on in our schools. Now, I had heard there was a young girl who wanted to identify as a boy who went into the opposite sex bathroom again, okay? And so how are we gonna address that issue? Because it's not safe for the girl. Okay, just because she's confused and doesn't understand her, ident her identity, it is our job to make sure that she is safe. Now, what if that boy, okay, who didn't want to see the girl undress, okay, for whatever reason, whether he's a Christian or not, is regardless, what if that girl got raped? What if? That's not safe for her, and so from the beginning, now, just so you understand who I represent, okay, Protect Our Children Project, we are now in 24 counties, with directors in 24 counties. We're going statewide. So when we come here with 200 strong a year and a half ago, and we have to go in the other room, what's gonna happen when we come 1,000 strong, okay? Because your jobs, even yours, Ms. Hardy, is at risk. Because the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the hills, and all the people shall flow to it. For out of Zion will come forth the law. Joseph right to monitor their health and provide health care. It's your job to provide education. Okay, and I understand you want to do it in a safe manner so that everybody's protected and covered, but that's where the parental's choice comes in. You know, my body, my choice. If I want to wear a mask, I'll wear a mask. If I want my child to wear a mask, or if my child wants to wear a mask, they will put a mask on. I have two students in Pasco schools. Two. Okay, one of them was a senior this year, the other one's kindergarten. The senior would had to go through all this lockdown and virtual learning and all that. She went from having an A, B, high C average to failing everything last year because of the lockdowns and the mask mandates and all that stuff. Put her back so far that she actually has to take three extra classes this year just to have enough credits to graduate. That is ridiculous. You guys are talking about, you know, mental health. Now you want to make September mental health, you know, for all that. You know, people are having, you know, the suicide and the depression and all that. I live with it. I have a 17 year old daughter at home that's dealing with that daily. So for these people to sit there and tell me that I don't care, no, I'm not gonna stand there for that. My job as a parent is to make sure that my daughter goes to school and gets the education that you guys are providing her, okay? Not for somebody else to dictate to me how I should raise my child, how I should raise my son. It's not happening. This is America. 
we have that brain. These people do not get the deck to dictate what I do or don't do. You know, you guys, you have a tremendous amount on your plate, and I understand that. Thank God we have a governor that's willing to stand up for it. We came down here from Pennsylvania, okay? Governor Tom Wolf up there is horrible, horrible. They just imposed mass mandates again up there for the area that we live in. It's horrible. At least you guys have the freedom of choice down here, which is what America is all about. You have the freedom of choice. If you want your child to go to school with a mask on, if your mask works that well, go for it. If you don't want to, go for it. You have that choice. As far as vaccines for kids, like somebody was mentioning back there, no one.
curriculum items, procedures, and set policies, you don't get a say in that either. And that disturbs me. I want our board to do what they're elected to do, which is to protect our children, make sure they have a healthy, safe environment to learn in, and that you get a say in what that curriculum is, what it pertains to, what we're teaching our elementary school kids, what we're teaching our high school kids. In the 10.3, there is an opt-out, but it only pertains to fourth grade through eighth grade. Or that was the health education program. The parents could opt out, but what about the older kids if their parents want to opt out? There's no option for that. So in reference to transparency, I'd like to see our board be allowed to make more decisions about the everyday workings of our school, and that as far as curriculum goes, and safety.
from the superintendent to the board members to everybody who helps make this system go forward. But we're in a different situation now. Um, Pasco County and the state of Florida and our country, we're in a pandemic. And I understand nobody wants to be in a pandemic. I don't, my kids don't, my family doesn't, your families probably don't. I can't imagine anybody out there that would want to be in this situation that we're in. And you're even in a more difficult situation because we're here standing up here and we're imploring you and we're sending you emails and we're asking you to, to act on behalf of a situation that could provide safety to the kids in this community. All of them. I have no sides whatsoever. I respect everybody out here. They're arguing, they're here to be, they're, they're here for their children. No, no, no will whatsoever. Uh, but I feel like this, this situation has become politicized. It's become politicized and it's become politicized toward, towards things like freedom, parental rights. And those words are being thrown around recklessly in my opinion. And, and I'm a huge proponent of parental rights, as we all are who are parents, and we should be. But what we also have to understand is those rights aren't unlimited. There's, there's reasons for the government to step in and limit parental discretion. Okay, it's public safety, community health. It's been done, vaccine mandates. Your kids all are vaccinated when they come to school. You're required to have them in a seat belt or a car seat. They have numerous safety regulations over the years. And it's state law and Supreme Court law. It goes back years and can justify these. These parental rights, we're not taking away people's parental rights, we're protecting the community. I'm asking you as a board to stand up with the other 13 counties and do what we, we would want all of, all of our county to have done for our kids. It's have them protected. Have them in school, have them provided an in-person education, which is so important, especially in a tremendous area that we have that is provided and boarded. It is, it is almost criminal for them not to be able to be able to attend school. But they need to be able to do it safely. And, and I would just end on the statement. Thank you, sir. I do that. Thank you very much. Can you email that to me, sir? I will. Hi, I'm Tia Dutieri. I'm with Diamond Trinity. Um, I can get out my exact address. That's okay. I have it on the paper, I believe. I have two children in Pasco School District. Fortunately, I feel blessed. I left New York two years ago, about six months before this all began. began. And based on what I'm seeing from my children's friends back in New York, compared to the children here in Pasco County, I believe with the way things are going here in this county, our children are able to excel and um, get better opportunities with their learning. Uh, a lot of my children's friends are suffering from depression and other mental illnesses back in New York. They're still in basic lockdowns and mass mandates. I personally believe that we all have the right to make the choice. If you wanna wear a mask, wear a mask. If you don't, don't. I believe putting masks on children is child abuse. There are a lot of people that disagree with me, and that's perfectly fine. I suffer anxiety every time I see babies and children in masks. Does anyone care if I have an anxiety attack and fall on the floor? Not at all. I respect their choice to wear a mask. I'm not gonna fight with them. I'm not gonna make them feel terrible. I'm not gonna try and manipulate them or guilt them to do what I feel is right. I appreciate the fact that you all have set in place that we, as parents, can make the choice for ourselves, for what's best for our children. No one knows what other people's medical conditions are, whether or not they can wear a mask or not wear a mask. And I think that we should be able to give each other respect, be kind to other choices that others make, and I hope that you will continue to let our children flourish by making the choice on our own. Thank you so much.
You gonna say something, honey? You can say something. Don't. Don't. Yeah. Walk, walk away. I don't need you to go anywhere. Okay, we need to do this woman's right thing. Don't. You say one more word, you're out. Don't say a word. But why are you talking to her? She's okay. leaving. What's your name She's and badge leaving. number? That's not a word. I'm just asking. My name's Sergeant Oki, 3354. Thank you. Can I ask you why they put the gentleman Because what's good for one isn't good for the other around Pasco County, Florida. A cab. A cab. Okay. I'm going to wait right here and see what they're trying to talk about you. Hmm? They're talking about you. I just want to. I work these hearings maybe once or twice a year, okay. so this is the first time. I just want to make sure people know and are aware. So you're of the belief that I assaulted your husband, that's what you're saying? Not her husband, it's not her husband. the gentleman is that you're talking about? It was the dude. I'm just asking. But you're having a public conversation, But it's about her. It's literally about her, so it is. The man tried to assault me. Why do you think he was removed? I assaulted him. Why do you think he was removed? I'm not talking to you, I'm asking him a question. Because I'm allowed to stand right here, that's why. That's cool. Yeah, what's your name and badge number? My name and badge number? Yeah, your name uh, and badge number. Thank you, Tom. sir, for your information. You're, you're welcome. Your first and last name? Perrin. Tom, Tom Perrin. Perrin. And what, yes. Do you what's have a badge name? number? I don't need to give yeah, you my I num name. I don't, I don't you're, oh. I office, ma'am. I work for the school. Of course just, you do. You're part of the school to prison pipeline. I got you. No, I got you. Yeah, it's the school to prison pipeline that your officers are in schools taking children to prison for things that should be dealt on this level, not on the police level. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, go fuck yourself. You're so full of shit. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. It's time to let those people out of jail, too. Oh, and hey. Hey, while we're at it, ladies, could y'all tell Jason Duckworth I said hey? Thanks. No, I'm just the one that recorded it and was assaulted by a police officer, but good, I'm glad. Didn't get into it. Jason Duckworth walked straight up to that man and knocked him out. Yeah, and I know exactly who you are, and I know exactly who you are, and you're all fucking domestic terrorists. Thank you. I am accusing you of being a domestic terrorist. Absolutely. fucking lutely Okay. Sure, absolutely. No, but you're allowed to. You can assault people. You can start shit. You can do whatever you want, but you. All right. Let me put you in my car. The fuck? I'm, I'm right over here. Oh. Yeah, absolutely. These bitches are tweaking. 